Hello, everyone. I'm Martin Seemann, working uh, at Protocol Labs in the, uh, on, on lip 2 p And um, I want to bring, bring the, in, in this talk, I want to talk about um, lip 2 p and what options we have there um, to improve the connectivity situation across, across the network. And this is um, mostly, mostly focusing on browsers because this is where lip 2 p um, uh, doesn't perform as well at the moment. So in general, what is a lip 2 p connection? It's a point-to-point -point -point connection between two lip 2 p nodes. And since there's no one size fits all, as we will see later, um, each lip 2 p host has, um, offers different connection options. Um, they are encoded in multi-addresses. You can see there's a multi-address for a TCP listener on port uh, 10,000 and for a quick listener on port uh, 20,000. 20, uh, in general, lib P2P connections are encrypted. We run a security handshake, and we have multiple options there. Um, we, we use uh, noise and uh, TLS 1.3. Um, that, that gives us, well, first of all, an encrypted connection and uh, knowledge of the remote peers ID. Um, after a connection is encrypted, uh, after a TCP connection is encrypted, uh, we apply a stream multiplexer, something like Yamux, Mplex, or hopefully soon something something better than that. Uh, for Quick, we don't need to do do all of this because Quick connections are um, encrypted and and uh, stream multiplexed on the transport level. So this uh, this table shows um, shows the connection options that we have. So I've been talking about uh, TCP and QUIC, and these are only available in, um, in full nodes. Let's call them full nodes, um, namely in lib 2 p and in lib 2 p QUIC is still a work in progress in, in lib 2 p but we should, we should get there pretty soon. Uh, in the browser, um, you can't just open a TCP or a QUIC connection. Um, why is that? Browsers open TCP and quick connections all the time to run HTTP on top of that. But in order to comply with the security model, they don't allow, they don't allow the user to open a raw TCP or a raw quick connection. This is a problem for us because we want to connect browsers to um, go lib 2 p nodes. Imagine um, browser wants to go to the DHT and find where, where a certain file is, a certain CID is, and then download it from there. Um, we can't use TCP and Quick for, for that. Um, browsers, therefore, have developed a bunch of different protocols uh, that you can use instead um, that more or less make it possible for the browser to control the security properties of that connection. Um, and these are WebSocket, um, WebTransport, and WebRTC. And I'll, I'll go into the problems that each of those, um, that each of those pose for lib 2 p later. Um, as you can see, none of those are fully implemented in lib 2 p yet, but this is what the lib 2 p team is focusing on uh, right now, and you will see a lot of progress in this table over the next uh, over the next month so let's start with websocket websocket is a pretty old protocol was specified in in 2011 it basically converts a, a http connection into a full duplex uh, tcp connection so what you do is you establish a tcp connection to uh, no you establish an http connection to the server then you have this special um, the special WebSocket upgrade um, HTTP request. And if the server agrees to this, this basically means like we are not doing HTTP anymore. We are now using the raw TCP underlying TCP connection from that moment on. And there's also a way to do this over HTTP2. So you can have, you can have multiple streams on top of, um, on top of the same connection. The problem with this is we can use this in, in lib 2 p but the browser will enforce the, um, 
enforce encrypted connections. So if you loaded a website via HTTPS, which is basically every website that you load nowadays, um, the browser won't, will just not let you establish a WebSocket connection. You need to, um, and this is the error that you get um, when you do it, when you try to do it, um, you need to do a WebSocket secure connection, which is a WebSocket running on not an HTTP connection, but an HTTPS connection. The problem for LP2P is our nodes usually don't have certificates. Well, we do have certificates, but we have self-signed certificates. And of course, a browser will not trust a self-signed certificate. A browser will um, require a certificate from, from a CA that it trusts, let's say Let's Encrypt. Um, you can get those Let's Encrypt certificates for free, but you need the domain name to get them. Let's Encrypt doesn't issue um, doesn't issue certificates for IP addresses. So it's feasible for some nodes in our networks to get a domain name. Like if you are an, an, an operator, like a pinning service or something, then you probably already have a domain name. You probably also already have a, a TLS certificate. And you can use that for your WebSocket connection. There's an option in, in the P2P where you pass in the, the TLS config and your node will be reachable via um, secure WebSockets. But this is, this is only a minority of the nodes in the network, like probably 90, 95, 99% will not have this certificate and won't be, won't be able to obtain the certificate because they have the domain name. So WebSocket will, will be a fringe, um, fringe use case uh, in lib 2 p There's another problem with this approach uh, and it's the number of round trips it takes. So if we, if we count them, um, we do one TCP handshake, takes a round trip. We do a TLS handshake, takes another round trip. We do the WebSocket upgrade, HTTP request, takes a round trip. We then negotiate the security protocol for the lib P2P handshake, um, takes another round trip. Uh, we, do that, we do that handshake, takes another round trip. We then negotiate Amplex or Yamax, takes yet another round trip. So we are at six round trips. We can optimize this a little bit with uh, protocol select. I don't want to go into detail, um, details about this. This might save us uh, two network round trips, but we are still at four round trips, which is uh, quite a bit. And we're doing double encryption here because the, 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 the underlying TCP connection is, is encrypted and then we run um, noise, noise or another TLS on top of that. And double encryption obviously is not great for for performance. Yes, I think I already already explained. Like um, getting getting a certificate is um, is difficult. There might be a way around this. Um, I've seen that Zero SSL does issue IP certificates. Um, I haven't looked into this in in detail, but this might be a way to a way to move this forward. So let's look at web transport. Um, web transport is a new protocol. Um, there's not even an RFC yet. It's at the it's under development at the ITF. There's a there's a web transport working group. Um, it is you can, like conceptually you can think of it as WebSocket but done over Quick. So you get a lot of the benefits of of Quick um, right out of the box. Yes, the stream multiplexing. Um, you have a very fast handshake. You have Quick's advanced loss recovery and, and congestion control. Um, so if, if you have the choice between WebSocket and Web Transport, you probably want to use Web Transport. Like when you have the choice between TCP and Quick, you probably want to use Quick. It also works by sending a kind of upgrade request. Um, it looks a little bit different because this is HTTP 3 and not um, HTTP 1.1. But conceptually, it's the same thing. It does, however, have the same same security requirements from the browser side. The browser also wants to see a certificate that it can trust. At least that's what we thought till January this year, uh, which which is why we thought like, okay, this will be like the same fringe use case that we have for WebSocket. Not very interesting for the P2P. But then the W3C um, 
change the standard. And they said, we, we, we want to, of course we want to support normal TLS certificates, but we also want to support like really short-lived um, virtual machine deployments where the node doesn't go to Let's Encrypt and gets a certificate. So what you can do now is you can tell the browser, connect to the server. If the server gives you a CA signed certificate, fine, just validate that one. But you can also tell the browser if the certificate has the following hash, and that's a SHA-256 hash, then just regard it as a valid certificate as well. And this is exactly what we need for lib P2P, right? We have these multi addresses that we can encode stuff into. So now we can have an, a, a web transport address that doesn't only say like this is this IP address and this port, but we can also say like this node has, a, has the following hash. And here we, have, we can specify two hashes. Um, well, actually, you can, in the multi-address, you can specify as many hashes as you want. Um, because Web Transport does pose some, um, some restrictions on the certificate um, that you can use. As I said earlier, this is intended for short-lived um, short VMs. So one of the things that the browser will do when it gets the certificate, it will not only verify the, the hash of the certificate, it will also verify that it's not RSA. Okay, fine, we can, we can do that. Um, but it will also say like the certificate cannot be long, uh, valid for longer than 14 days. Which means if we want to build this into lib P2P and we have nodes that run a lot longer than just 14 days, we will need to rotate the certificate um, while the node is running to keep us um, accessible via web transport. So the idea is to, to generate one certificate valid for the first 14 days and another certificate for the next 14 days. And then after 14 days, you switch over the certificate and generate a new one. And, and as long as the browser got, the, the address, got your address less than 14 days ago, it will be able to connect to you. Uh, no, actually, less than, well, between 14 and 28 days. So this is all, um, this is stuff that we are working on right now. We haven't finalized the spec yet, so if you want to get involved, um, that's the specification. Uh, please review. Let's do the same, the same thing we did for, web, uh, for WebSocket and count the round trips. So we have one round trip for the, the quick handshake. Then we have another round trip for the web transport request. And then we have one round trip for the noise handshake that we run on top of that web transport stream. We need to do this, this noise handshake because we need to make, we need to, to learn about the peers peer ID. And in this noise handshake, this is the first time we can actually control the certificate that, um, that, that we are, well, I should say the other way around. Like we can control the certificate um, that's used for the quick handshake but we, can on, we only have full control over the noise handshake. And this is the first place where, we can, where the client can authenticate itself um, um, towards the server. It should be possible to run step two and three at the same time. The specification allows it. But as I said, like this is still, the ITF is still working on this protocol. Um, and the browser manufacturers are also still working on this protocol. So at the moment, it takes three round trips. But in principle, it should be, it should be possible to, to do a step two and three at the same time, which would bring us down to just two network round trips to have a, a fully functioning lib P2P connection set up. So this is huge. So web transport allows us to connect browser nodes to Go lib P2P nodes and to Rust lib P2P nodes. What Web Transport doesn't allow you is to connect two browser nodes to each other. Why is that? Because you can't start a Web Transport server inside your browser. There's just no, no API for that. So for the browser to browser use case, there's just one protocol that you can use, which is WebRTC. 
And you all know WebRTC because it's used by, uh, by tools like, like Zoom or Google, Google Meet or Google Video Hangout, however it's called today. Um, it's, a, uh, it's, it's been defined um, since tw 2014. There are actually quite a lot of RFCs that define this protocol and WebRTC combines a lot of other protocols to, to make it work. It's mainly built for audio and video conferencing, but there's also this thing called RTC data channels, which is just as the name says, um, a uh, or ordered byte stream abstraction um, using WebRTC. And it comes with multiple streams, with, with, with uh, stream multiplexing uh, at the transport layer. So that's pretty nice. How do you establish a, a WebRTC connection? In, in WebRTC, there's this thing called the SDP, um, stands for the Session Description Protocol. Um, it's basically just a long description saying like, these are my addresses, these are my audio codecs, these are my video codecs that I support. And the two nodes need to exchange those SDPs. And once they've done that, they will, WebRTC will establish the connection, punching through, through firewalls if necessary, um, and at the end, returning you a WebRTC connection. The web are, so so we, we, we kind of have a chicken and egg problem here, right? We want to establish a connection between those two nodes, but to do that, we need to exchange these SDPs. And the WebRTC spec doesn't tell you how to do that. It's your own problem. Deal with it. You can use WhatsApp. You can use SneakerNet, anything. Um, so what, do, what, what, what will we do in, in LIP2P? For our, for our hole punching protocol, we've rolled out something called uh, limited relays across the network. Um, a limited relay is, as the name says, it's, it's a relay that is willing to transfer a limited amount of data for a limited amount of time. It's very cheap to run a, a limited relay. So if you start a, a lib 2 p node, and that lib 2 p node is, detects that it's in a public position, not behind a firewall, it will start that relay service. And other nodes can use it then. So the plan in lib 2 p is to just use this, this huge fleet of, of relays that's now been already been deployed um, to, to, to exchange these SDPs. Um, in the browser, it's um, how, how, do you, how do you establish the um, uh, a WebRTC connection? You, you, you need to generate your own certificate. And since Web, uh, WebRTC is built as a peer-to-peer -peer protocol made for video conferencing, there's no certificate check. Like, you don't need, you don't need a CA site certificate. Unfortunately, the API is kind of limited. The only thing that you can pass into the generate certificate function is a, is a key, key, key generation algorithm. So we can't encode the lib2p peer ID um, into the certificate. So what we'll do is we'll first establish the WebRTC connection, and then similar to what we do in web, uh, in, in web transport, we open a stream, run another noise handshake, and learn the, the, the remote uh, peer ID. So this is also, uh, also getting, getting specified and worked on right now. Um, we are expecting to, to have something to show in the next, next couple of months. Uh, I'm pretty excited about this. Um, all of the work is happening in, in our specs. Like to, to make any changes in libp2p, we first need to make a spec change, then we write the code. So if you want to get involved, um, the specs repository is the best way. And with that, I thank you for your attention. <laughs> any questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, I'm wondering, so with web transport, do we still have the same problem as web sockets, uh, namely uh, double encryption, that is the web transport encryption and the noise encryption? We don't. Because um, we can use that certificate to make sure that there's, no, th there's, we can use the certificate hash to make sure that there's no man in the middle in the connection. So if you think about 
um, what would happen if there was a man in the middle in, in the connection? Then we would have a different certificate hash, right? So we run the noise handshake, which gives us first the PRIDs, but then on this noise, noise handshake, we also send the certificate hash. So the server will see if the certificate hash that the client has got out of this handshake matches the certificate that it actually owns. And it will not accept the connection if, if, if there's a mismatch. So we run this handshake once on the first stream. And as soon as this handshake completes, we know there's no man in the middle in the connection. We know the peer IDs. We can just use the raw uh, web transport streams after that. Oh, so essentially we don't need noise in this. We, 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 we need the, the first noise handshake, but we don't need to encrypt uh, okay. any, any application data okay. with noise after that. Right. Um, and if it's okay, another question. Um, you mentioned, so with WebRTC, that you, essentially one of the advantages that we have is that we have these leap P2P hosts and uh, they have this kind of like limited relay functionality, which we can now use to exchange these SDPs, right? Yes. Is the limited relay functionality, is that essentially what is used for uh, circuit relay V2? Yes. And does and that mean that we can now use all of these leap P2P hosts to do the whole punching for WebRTC um, okay. running in the browser, essentially. So browser to browser, they can just rely on this whole swarm of leap P2P hosts yes. to do the whole punching? Well, not to do the whole punching. Okay. Um, so th this is a little bit technical. Um, we use the, those nodes running the circuit B2 protocol, as you said, to do the whole punching between Go leap P2P and Rust leap P2P nodes. Um, for WebRTC, we don't need to do the whole punching ourselves. In fact, we can't because this is all inside the WebRTC stack. WebRTC stack comes with hole punching capabilities. And we can't just go to the browser and say like, no, we do our own hole, hole punching, disable your hole punching. There's no API for that. So what we'll use the, the, the relays for is just to exchange the STP and then we hand it to the browser and say like, now do your thing, hole punch uh, as much as you need to, just give us the connection. Does that make sense? So it would still basically enable browsers to connect to other browsers using these leap P2P hosts. Yes. It's just that these leap P2P hosts aren't using circuit relay. They're just using the, they're implementing essentially whatever the WebRTC standard uh, in, uh, defines. It, it, it's using circuit relay to exchange the SDP. Okay, got it. Thank you. Just kind of a quick sanity check, but web transport can't, it has to, it's designed to go to a server. Is it? Can you use it to go like laptop to laptop? No, and you not? can't. Cool. Good stuff, Martin. A couple quick questions. Your table earlier had uh, web transport is a red X, um, but there are some, can you explain the browser implementation story? Oh, and sorry, that's in JS the P2P. I guess, for what browsers have implemented web transport? Um, at the moment, only, only Chrome. Well, you need to distinguish between web transport and web transport with its server certificate hashes. Um, server certificate hashes has been implemented in Chrome since like, April or May uh, this year. Um, the other browsers are still working on their web transport implementation. At the moment, it's not clear if they will implement the uh, server certificate hashes function, at least for Safari, it's not clear. Firefox has said, like, we, we view this um, this whole trans, uh, web transport thing as like one specification. And if we do web transport, we'll also do server certificate hashes. And for Apple, well, you know it after they ship. Great, good stuff. And if, I mean, I think this is really exciting. If a bunch of people wanted to dogpile and help make this a reality, what are some of the key ways that the community or folks could get involved to bring reality to this? Yes, so as I said, specification. Um, is the, the best way to, to, to get started. Um, we also need, need help with the implementation. Um, there's or for, for, web RTC, uh, for web transport, there is a pull request. Uh, for web RT, uh, RTC, there's a pull request since today. Um, for JS lib P2P, we also need help with the implementation um, for, um, for, for web transport and for web RTC. So if you want to get involved, now is a good time. Great, thanks, yeah. Hope we can get some others involved to make this happen. 
Um, I heard that there was a spec in the works for giving raw TCP and UDP access. Is that something that is on your radar slash actually happening slash potentially useful for libp2p? I have not heard of that. Is that for the browser? Yeah. <laughs> I, I would be very interested in that. If you could send a link my way, that would be very much appreciated. Cool, will do. Is there a path forward for like, yeah, like browser to browser, peer-to-peer uh, -peer stuff without an internet connection? And yeah, like, yeah, I guess that's the question. And, and or with maybe some hub in the room that doesn't have a global internet connection, how do you see like putting these together to make that work? Or is that still down, down the line? So, so, so browser to browser requires WebRTC, as I've explained. Um, I'm not sure if the if the WebRTC protocol allows you to to use something like MDNS. Like th this is what what we're using for um, GoLibP2P and RustLibP2P nodes. Um, they discover each other via MDNS and then just dial each other's connection. Um, I'm not sure if the WebRTC specification has something for that use case. It and would be super cool. That's the one where you said you just have to exchange STPs somehow. Yeah. And so, as long as like I don't know if I just scanned a QR. There's a QR code on the wall that we yeah. both scanned. Could that then work with WebRTC? Yeah. The, the, so the, the question that, that you need to need to answer is like, how do you exchange that SDP? Um, because you present your, your uh, SDP to one peer, and the other peer presents its own, and, and they negotiate what's common and how they can set up the connection. So, so and do those need to rotate code. pretty well? Or could I have like a business card with my preferred SCP that I don't have to reprint on? I don't know. Are you going to get one at home and one would... So, so, so um, the, the SDP, if, if the, the question was if you can have a, a business card with your with your SDP like encoded in a QR code or so. So, so the, the SDP contains your IP address. So as long as you have a static IP address, it's possible. But if you're in a home network, you probably don't, to, but you could configure your router to give you one. There was an IPFS engineer at Aragon, uh, Aki Gorka. He was at last IPFS camp as well. And he did a demo of dual QR codes between two machines on a local subnet as a WebRTC connection passing the SDP. Cool. I'll find the link and drop it in the channel. All right. Thanks, Martin. Thank you.